Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and usually Auto House of Naples, but today I have a car from a private collection that frankly I just really wanted to review, so here it is. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited by it. Uh, this is a 1977 Pontiac Grand Prix SJ Coupe basically is all Grand Prix were up until this point. It wasn't until many years later that you got some Grand Prix sedans. Uh, they were uh, historically a coupe offering from Pontiac. Um, but, uh, you know, let's look at it in the context of the times for the moment. 1977. Uh, what have you got going on? You've got Star Wars was released in the cinema, so was Saturday Night Fever. Uh, you know, you really couldn't go wrong with that. And you had the Commodore Pet, the Apple II, and the Atari 2600 released, uh, all of which went on to become successful. The Atari, not so much until my mom bought me one in 1981. Uh, you also had well, that big 747 disaster at Tenerife uh, in the Canary. There was a bomb that went off in uh, Grand Canary and the Canary Islands, so all these airplanes were. Uh, diverted to this small airport uh, in Tenerife, uh, which drove the controllers crazy. All of a sudden, I mean, this place that's used to having nothing but some regional flights, all of a sudden there's like 70, you know, big 747s hanging out. And uh, it ended up being the worst disaster in aviation history. Uh, two 747s collided, a KLM and a Pan Am, uh, mostly because the KLM captain was a douchebag. Uh, but it did happen in heavy fog and, you know, there was some confusion confusion at the time, but that was a big deal. You've got Jimmy Carter getting elected, and his first act is to give away the Panama Canal. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he did, I could use a glass of Billy beer this morning. And uh, what else in 77? I don't know. There was some other. I guess Quebec uh, made French their official language. That was crafty. There was a 25-hour blackout in New York City that led to looting and lots of babies. And, uh, yeah, there was some other stuff that happened. Uh, so 77 was an interesting year. The median home price was like 49 grand, and gas, uh, which was expensive at the time, was 65 cents a gallon. And uh, there it is. That is the stage for which this uh, Pontiac, the final year of this, uh, what is this, the third generation Grand Prix, uh, was released onto the world. And actually, it did fantastically well in 1977. Uh, to this day, because of course Pontiac is no more, uh, is and was and it forever will be the best selling Grand Prix of all time. More than 280,000 of these things uh, were produced in 1977. That was a very, very prolific uh, person in luxury coupe at the time. Uh, competed directly with the Monte Carlo from Chevrolet, which was also on uh, the A Special body, which I'll get into in a minute, and uh, a variety of other offerings. Uh, 77 was the downsized Ford Thunderbird, which sold like hotcakes. I think it outsold this car, uh, but this still did very well against it. Also the Mercury Cougar. And uh, if there, look at these birds going A shit. The cats were already out this morning. I didn't get them on video, but they were running around this car and looking at me and they're feeling menacing. I don't think the goats are around, but Peter claims he's now released them from their pen so they could be out at any moment, which is not great. Uh, the only thing I have going for me is the weather is still a little bit nice. Um, you see, and there again, animals come by and I get discombobulated and forget wherever the hell I was. So, uh, anyway, the, oh, in 77, you could also get the Merc, uh, what was it, the AMC Matador uh, Barcelona, which was probably the most unattractive luxury coupe ever made, which is why I absolutely love it. Uh, but that was another offering. And of course, the personal luxury coupes were off the charts uh, all through the 70s and uh, into 77. And that's why Pontiac sold so many of these things. They were the third biggest division, not division, sorry, the third biggest automaker uh, from like 1973 on through this year. So they were selling a ton of cars. And uh, to some extent, you can thank uh, Mr. DeLorean for that, but we'll get into it. So, uh, the first Grand Prix came out in 1962, and it was based on the Catalina platform. Uh, and it was sort of a detuned Catalina, and it was a sporty uh, alternative to uh, some other Pontiac cars. It had bucket seats and a center console. Uh, that generation ran, I want to say, through... Um, what was it, 1968, and then in 69, the second-gen Grand Prix came out, uh, which was, 
a very, very attractive car. Uh, it, the Grand Prix of 69, you can lend it. Uh, ah, there's some debate. I don't even know if it's debate. The name SJJ and uh, SSJ, which were the models that came out in 1969 through 72, uh, were in no way shamelessly based on the same name Duesenberg. And some people say the styling relates to that Duesenberg as well, uh, which is fine. Maybe it does. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, talk about setting your sights high. <laughs> I mean, for America's first supercar, the uh, Duesenberg SJ. Uh, but anyway, that ran through uh, 73, or sorry, 72, until this style came out in 73, a year late because of strikes with the UAW and other stuff going on. Uh, this car should have been out, uh, this style of car should have been out in 72. Uh, but anyway, it sold well. Uh, DeLorean, who had a lot of input on the first Grand Prix when he was the uh, head of advanced engineering at Pontiac, uh, by the time 69 rolled around, he was the head of Pontiac and uh, helped to, he didn't create it, but he certainly promoted the niche of the personal luxury car market. And uh, that is something that went on to be one of the most prolific sellers in American automotive history. In 77, the personal luxury coupes accounted for like more than 10% of all automotive sales in the United States, which is a huge figure, way, way more than a million cars. So uh, this was quite a uh, hot market at the time. <clears throat> and uh, and it was fascinating that there were so many entrants in it and so many competitors for this car, not just from other makers, but also within uh, the GM division, which is part of what ultimately led to their uh, serious troubles, was just inter division competitiveness and badge engineering and you know it was a real problem but I don't think anybody could say that this uh, particular Grand Prix was badge engineered uh, even if it was one of the very prolific colonnade cars uh, they came out this was that special okay so uh, real quick see so, uh, the second gen uh, Grand Prix which also shared a platform with some other cars was the G body and it was based on a stretched a body platform uh, when 70 three came out they just made it the a body and then this was called a special body and uh, frankly when I was younger I did have a few girls with a special body there was no doubt about that but uh, they did away with the G body thing until the next generation which came out in 78 uh, went back to being a full-on G body so uh, you know it's just typical GM crap with all the body stuff it could drive you crazy and the people who harp in on it and you know talk about it like it's important oh god I don't know. They drive me nuts. I mean, who the hell cares what body is what? But anyway, the A bodies were very prolific and they incorporated a few new styling cues that were uh, mostly done to comply with federal regulations. For instance, gone was the hard top coupe uh, of the first two generations. And what that was, was a full side a uh, set of windows which uh, the rears could be lowered, leaving no glass on the side of the car at all. Uh, in was this colonnade thing, uh, which gave you fixed opera windows at the back. Uh, they called it a six-window platform. You see that crazy curved windshield at the rear? Very, very cool. I do like that. Uh, but anyway, the colonnade could be had in a variety of different A-bodies, uh, even three within Pontiac's own division, at least three, if not more. Uh, three I can think of are the Grand Prix, uh, the Le Mans, and the Grand Am. And then, of course, you had subsets of those, like the GTO and Can-Am and that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, so the A-bodies were all over the place, and every division had one except for Cadillac, which didn't. And uh, there was, you know, basically a lot of competition right within the own GM ranks uh, in terms of, uh, you know, then there was the Malibu, the Monte Carlo, the Regal, the Cutlass Supreme. Uh, all of these cars used A-bodies body platforms and they all in some way or another competed with each other but only two the Monte Carlo and the Grand Prix shared the special uh, a special platform which was a longer version of the a body oh my god is that all a mouthful in 73, when it came out, it had all Pontiac motors, and they were, you know, even though the emissions thing were starting to come into play, they were still pretty big motors. The base motor was a 400. Uh, I think you could even get it with a two-barrel then. That might have been later on, but anyway, it was a 400. Uh, and then they had a 455. 
uh, which uh, you could get. There was going to be a 455 Super Duty Grand Prix, uh, but uh, that didn't work out, and uh, they, you know, they, they supply problems absolutely plagued this line through the whole uh, run, especially when it became so successful that they're selling 280 plus thousand cars. They just couldn't get shit for it. I mean, how do you keep up with that level of production? I'm probably forgetting a 350 or something that you might have gotten in 72, but I don't think so. I think it was just the 400 and 455. And uh, in this gen, this third gen, it was only Turbo Hydra 400 transmissions. There were no manuals you could get uh, because the Grand Prix wasn't really... Uh, it was luxury sport, if you will. I mean, its its primary mission was not to go fast or to be all luxury. It was to sort of bridge the gap between the two. Uh, the Grand Am, to a lesser extent, was... And, and it, that was meant to compete with the European cars, which were getting hot at the time. Uh, the BMWs and Mercedes. And that was more or less a Pontiac Le Mans with a Grand Prix interior and a Trans Am hood. So that was kind of a neat piece. Uh, and then the, the Le Mans, which was a slightly less expensive Grand Prix. And then you could get into the Pontiac full-size stuff like the Bonneville uh, or the Catalina, which was, of course, a, a much bigger car. Uh, but anyway, one of the interesting things about this gen of Grand Prix is how the engines changed over time. So it went from the... Uh, 400, 455, uh, that carried on for a couple of years, but the horsepower ratings kept going down. Uh, in 75, the dual exhaust was done away with, and it, you know, because of catalytic converters ruined it. And uh, then there was definitely a 350 by 75. And then in 77, the 301 came out. Uh, it was an all new engine from Pontiac, based on prior architecture, but still all new. At the same time, the Iron Duke four cylinder came out, and they Shared a bore and stroke, and uh, essentially that meant you could take the pistons from an Iron Duke and put them in the 301. Uh, the uh, the connecting rods and the aluminum pistons were the same, and uh, what that was meant to do at the time was, you know, we've made this great powerful V8 engine which gets the gas mileage of a V6 and really motivates this car down the road just fine. But yeah, you know, it really didn't. Um, uh, at the time, it, it just didn't have enough horsepower under 200. And and uh, ended up being, I'll tell you what, it was a good motor and a fine motor and it ran well and it did enough and it certainly didn't suit racing, but it was good enough for day-to-day -day driving and it was very long-lived and reliable. Uh, but at the time it was not beloved, even though it uh, was uh, offered in most of the Grand Prix that were made in 1977. Uh, you could also opt for a 350 Pontiac or a 400 Pontiac. The 455 was gone by the time this car came out. Uh, that was the thing of the past. Uh, but uh, the 400 was the top dog motor in 49 states, and this one is so equipped. Uh, California, Pontiac wasn't, uh, their motors weren't uh, regular, they weren't uh, approved for the admission standards in California, so uh, you had Oldsmobile engines coming out in those. You had the 350 Olds and the 403 Olds, and when supplies of those ran short, because the Cutlass was selling so well, they even threw a few, a few 350 Chevys in some California models. Anyway, it all gets very, very convoluted. Uh, but this was a very, very handsome car. Uh, it's got a V-nose grill. Uh, they changed the grill almost every year from 73 to 77. They changed the headlights. In 73, the lights were, uh, they had just one single headlight on each side, two headlights total in the front. Uh, later on, it went to four rectangulars. Then they spaced them out with the parking light in between. Uh, they had a big uh, V grill in the beginning. Beginning. That went to a waterfall grill in the mid-70s, and then finally this last grill uh, in 77 was one year only. Uh, they also changed the taillights and uh, some of the other stuff. Uh, they all had those aero mirrors, no big chrome mirrors on the Grand Prix, part of that Pontiac sporty stuff. And uh, the beautiful Pontiac Rally 2 wheels, which I think are some of the most gorgeous steel wheels ever made. Uh, you can see they're color-coded on this car. Uh, very, very attractive. Uh, 
they did want to offer alloys, but supply problems made it impossible. They, uh, you know, on the, all the documents at the time, it said you could order alloys, even in 73, but was not meant to be. They ended up uh, probably just going to the Trans Ams and Firebirds, and uh, none ever made it onto a car. Uh, in 77, you could get alloys, but again, shortages, very tough to get, very few. Uh, 76 was a peak year for the Grand Prix. That's when you could get T-tops, Hearst top, they called it, from the company Hearst. Uh, cars were sent off to them to be converted. Uh, but even they couldn't keep up with demand. And uh, there was a 76 anniversary edition, anniversary gold, which had some special cues. And uh, that thing came standard with the Hearst top. And uh, that was about all they could handle. So very, very few other Grand Prix were... Uh, were offered with that top. So uh, anyway, I feel like I'm rambling all over the place on this car, but uh, you can see how it has slightly uh, bow-tailed rear. Uh, at some stage, the license plate moved from beneath the bumper to above the bumper. Uh, it had horizontal bar-type taillights that changed over the years until this 77 actually had medallions similar to what, uh, you know, these hairy-chested disco guys might wear uh, on their... Uh, on their uh, underneath their open shirt, so uh, that was quite handsome. Uh, you also had these sort of interesting Grand Prix uh, window appliques inside the opera windows, and uh, you know maybe that couldn't compete with uh, Cheryl Teagues and the Cougar, but it certainly had its own look. Uh, also, a variety of different styling options. Uh, the quarter top came on a lot of these cars, and uh, you know quite a few didn't have it, and they probably survived better because quarter tops when kept outside tend to rust. Uh, also have a pretty nice hood ornament up there at the front. And uh, I just love that V hood going into the uh, uh, raised fender edges and the split Pontiac grille with the arrowhead emblem in between. Uh, 73 brought the five mile an hour bumpers and you can see they continue on to this one in 77. But I think Pontiac did a pretty good job of integrating them and uh, not making them look uh, very, very unpleasant. So. Uh, all in all, I think this is an incredibly handsome car and beautifully designed. And again, DeLorean, a uh, real car guy, you know, a true genius in terms of marketing and styling. Uh, you can see the impact he had on this car. He had gone on, you know, an early, somewhere as Chevy, I believe. But uh, he heavily influenced uh, the prior gen and this gen as well, and the first gen. Uh, I love the way the doors taper down and then cut back up. Uh, that's kind of handsome. And when you put the windows down, it lets more of the outside in. Uh, you've got two contrasting body lines at the uh, one coming from the uh, rear uh, forward and up towards the center of the door, one swooping up from the front uh, and also towards the center of the door, and uh, none for a little bit of space in between. Uh, it just hit the mark, this car, in terms of styling. Uh, there were three different option packages. The uh, J, which was base, uh, they decontented a lot of the car from the earlier versions to make the price more attainable by, you know, everybody, which, again, helped sell a shitload of these things. The SJ, like this one, which was the sports version, uh, and did, of course, rob the name from the Duesenberg SJ, which uh, is kind of thought of as America's first supercar. Very collectible, very valuable car. And uh, then uh, the LJ, which was a luxury version of the Grand Prix, which uh, did incorporate a lot of luxury options. Uh, they varied from 73 to 77. It was an option package. Then it became its own model and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, there was also an SSJ, but I think that was just in the second gen, the prior gen to this one, uh, which was, uh, you know, made by Hearst or tuned by Hearst, if you will. Uh, there aren't that many of them, and uh, they're considered very collectible today. Uh, the, the Le Mans and, you know, Grand Am sort of moved along at the same pace as this. One interesting car, which deserves a brief mention, is the 77 Pontiac Can-Am, uh, which uh, they only made about a thousand of them. They had a shaker hood scoop from a Trans Am, kind of a neat front and rear bumper treatment, and uh, were meant to be very, very sporty at the time, and uh, are now pretty collectible based on their low numbers. So... Oh my god, it's all a mouthful getting in all this stuff, but you really do have to love the personal luxury coupe uh, genre that came, you know, all through the 70s. It really made some great old iron uh, that's a lot of fun to have around today. So, let's just get into this car.
before the sun comes out and ruins everything. It's already out, mostly. Uh, I picked this up from Al this morning, my friend Al. This is his uncle's car. Uh, Al is a, a lifelong friend of mine. Uh, he promised that he was going to have the car inside, uh, which, you know, he didn't when I got there this morning. Uh, it was all covered with mist and dew. Uh, thank you for that, Al. But, well, in his defense, he does smoke an awful lot of marijuana at night, so... All right, so that's not staying up the way it's supposed to. Let's try to do this one-handed. It's not always easy, and I don't want to scratch anything. Uh, I haven't actually opened the trunk, so uh, if I ever do get in here, we're going to discover together. Oh, for the love of God. What's in here? There it is. All right, so what's in here is nothing but what we would want to find, which is a trunk. Uh, you've got a spare tire covered by the uh, original little material stuff. You've got a jack underneath it. You've got a nice little padded carpet there. Uh, you can see it's had some rust proofing on it and uh, everything lovely and proper under here. Uh, Al's uncle owns the car. Uh, uncle Tommy, I believe his name, a very particular guy. Um, this is not his, by, by any stretch, his most valuable car. This one was probably a Lark. Uh, he's, uh, you know, really into the, uh, uh, you know, the Hearst Olds and the 442s and the Judges. And uh, we'll probably get into some of that stuff as we go if he's kind enough to <laughs> let us do them. But uh, anyway, there it is, the trunk. You can see the jacking instructions there. Uh, you know, a nice size, uh, nice tail lamps. Uh, behind here, you've got the uh, lovely hidden GM gas door where you flip the uh, license plate down. And, uh, you know, classic 70s stuff. Uh, well, these things do did appear in a lot of TV and the movies. I don't think any Grand Prix actually highlighted anything. Uh, I don't think there were any detectives that, you know, made the Grand Prix famous. They just sort of appeared as bit players in most of the uh, of the TV and movies that they were in, which was a lot. Well, let's have a look under the hood. Okay, so here it is. There is a 406.6 liter Pontiac uh, V8. Uh, this is the same engine that would have been in the Trans Ams at the time. Uh, in, in California, this would have been the 403 Olds, which just wasn't as high po uh, as the Pontiacs. And the Pontiac, you know, Pontiac. Part of the reason it was not available for sale in California is they really clung to their performance longer than the other companies did. Uh, the 400 Pontiac was still putting out over 200 horse uh, in this incarnation. Uh, it was still a pretty torquey, pretty excellent engine. And uh, it's wonderful that it's in this particular car. It really motivates it down the road a lot better than the 301. Uh, it could have come with... Uh, uh, would have or even the 350 so uh, you can see everything under here is absolutely lovely the era of Pontiac well by then it was corporate blue I believe that uh, I went to corporate black so that's still Pontiac blue that engine um, you know still the original uh, whatever this is the accordion air cleaner stuff all in nice shape all very lovely and you know befitting of a car Al's uncle would like so uh, nice to see that it's also air conditioned but uh, anyway, everything lovely under there and still made it to a turbo hydro transmission. Uh, no manuals available in the Grand Prix at all for this year or this generation in total. But uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. I also like the hidden wipers. Uh, they go behind the hood and they sit on nice little perches there. And uh, they're aluminum, which is a lovely look. Man, is that a cool hood. And I love the beauty stripe down the middle going into that Grand Prix. Uh, hood ornament, the split Pontiac grill, which is of course uh, historical. The four quad lamps look nice, and of course the Pontiac wide track. They were still advertising uh, Pontiacs as wide track cars in this era, and uh, you know that just looks beautiful to me. Very unique and uh, a nice. I mean, look at it, like the front of it's like a C ray or something. Uh, this car really does have tremendous boat overtones. I have to really bitch at Pontiac, though, a little bit for their uh, for their naming system. I mean, Pontiac has the most inconsistent naming in automotive history. They really, really do. I mean, when you go through the years, you could start with the Torpedo, the Streamliner. That went into the Chieftain and the Super Chief and that sort of thing. Then we start getting into this weird thing with, are we going to be racing? Are we going to be geography? What are we going to be? You've got the Le Mans. You've got the Bonneville. You've got the Safari. Uh, you've got the Parisienne, 
uh, then we keep progressing. It gets weirder. You get Grand Am, you get Grand, uh, what, what else, the Can Am, uh, you get uh, the J2000 in the 80s. Then you've got a series of birds and uh, mythical creatures. You've got Sunfires, you've got Phoenixes, you've got Firebirds, you've got uh, Trans Am, more racing. The GTO, Gran Turismo Omelagato, uh, DeLorean borrowed that from Ferrari for the name of his uh, sports car. Uh, you've got the Aztec, you've got the G8, uh, you got the 6000, you've got the Aster, the Ventura, the Catalina. Uh, it is just this endless mix of stuff that they can't seem to focus in on any one theme. And uh, finally, they uh, just did away with them all together. Uh, but 2008, the seventh generation Grand Prix came to an end, and that was it. That was the end of the Grand Prix. So, uh, okay, I'm going to pause it here for a minute, get my bag of crap in the trunk of the car, and pull up to where I'm going to have a little bit of shade to get into the interior, and then we'll go for a drive. Uh, in the meantime, hopefully the goats don't come out. Okay, we're back and rolling. And one thing that I forgot to mention was by far, I can't believe I forgot it, the most important event of 1977. And that was the message from the Ashtar Galactic Command. Uh, you know, this was a very big deal. In southern England, uh, people are watching, you know, they're in England, so they're what, they're sitting in their flats listening to the BBC and uh, eating chips and thinking about taking the tube in the morning and saying, you know, cheerio and having a cup of tea and all that. Uh, or actually they were watching ITV when all of a sudden the audio goes away and in comes a voice from the future called the Ashtar Galactic Command, a guy named Vrillian, took over the audio of the, uh, of the television and implored humanity to get together, to drop their weapons, to join together in peace, harmony, and unity uh, so that we could evolve into a brighter and more lovely future, which obviously we did. And uh, that's, uh, of course, where we're at today. So uh, very, very interesting stuff. And uh, thank you, uh, Virilian, I think was the name of the guy from the Ashtar Galactic Command uh, who helped set humanity on the correct course. Uh, actually, a really great hoax. And uh, that, you know, somebody had took over uh, one of the repeaters for the satellites or, you know, audio pickups or whatever the hell it was and figured out there was this little problem with it and was able to overcome the uh, <laughs> true audio of this brilliant cat. They never caught him, whoever it was, and uh, came up with this terrific thing. So uh, if you're ever bored, have a look at that, the Ashtar Galactic Command. Eh, I didn't know about it until I touched up on it last night. Uh, anyway, in 1973, this all-new A-body and these special A-bodies, A-special bodies, sorry, like the, uh, the Grand Prix and the Mani, uh, they got a front suspension right off the Camaro Firebird to improve the handling of the car, front and rear sway bars, rear coil springs. Uh, this was the first one, first Grand Prix, to have factory steel belted radials. And uh, in fact, that was the uh, famous radial tuned suspension uh, that uh, that uh, came on Pontiacs after that. Uh, it had variable uh, aspect power steering. It had hydraulic disc brake standard. And uh, at the time was considered to be a pretty good handling car. Uh, you know, that may or may not be true anymore <laughs> in terms of what we think of as a good handling car, uh, but back then it was and had a pretty modern suspension. So anyway, let's just get into it. Now you do have frameless glass, uh, even though you now have this colonnade top with the uh, fixed windows in the back, uh, at least the glass on the side remained frameless, which is nice. Uh, again, I love the dipping door panel. I mean, that is just a cool feature and uh, the kind of stuff you really would get from GM after a certain point. Uh, when the badge engineering went crazy, you know, a Cadillac Cimarron, you could probably put a door from that right on a Chevy Cavalier. I mean, there was no variation at all other than the quality of the trim panel and stuff. Uh, back then, they did differentiate their brands uh, enough to be kind of neat. And uh, even the engines were different and some of the toolings were different. Uh, they had some incredible options that you could get in the uh, earlier SSJ cars, which I just read about. 
Uh, yeah, black and white TVs, telephones, a lot of neat stuff. So uh, even though Pontiac and GM and all the divisions were moving towards this weird uh, badge engineered harmony where things just became too much like the other, uh, 73 through 77, there was still enough variation that uh, the, yeah, the brands retained their individual identities. Uh, if you got in a Monte Carlo of the same year as this, it would be very, very different uh, in terms of what you saw and felt around you, even if the underpinnings were all very much the same. Uh, but anyway, nice looking door panels, big swooping armrest there. Uh, surprised that this version, I guess the SJ doesn't have to have power windows, definitely the LJ would have, but we got window cranks there, nice door pull. Uh, you can see it's got wood paneling everywhere. Uh, in the 73, 4, and I think the 5s, that was real wood, uh, African uh, crossfire mahogany uh, veneer. Uh, you know, GM and their cheapness went on to uh, make it um, basically this contact paper stuff, but yeah, it still looked nice. And uh, everything nice and tight and proper on the door panel there. Uh, these high bucket seats became uh, standard in 73. Uh, a no-cost option. You could also get a bench seat if that's what you wanted, if you needed to fit three across. And then they did have some reclining buckets you could also get. Uh, in the rear seat, and I left this here. I didn't mess with any of this. Let me lift this up so we get in. Um, you can see your Canadians would be chipper back there. I left in his... Uh, his show car plaque thing that, uh, and also the Pontiac hat because eh, it's not mine to move, but uh, you could fit your three Canadians back there in this, uh, what do they call this, Malahide or something, the, the Pontiac vinyl, uh, Maca, whatever, doesn't matter. Anyway, nice vinyl interior and a uh, nice little plaque he had made up for this car or bought it with, I don't know. Uh, you've got two speakers on the back package shelf. Uh, you've got nice fit and finish. You know, that's a lie. <laughs> In 77, it really wasn't that nice, the fit and finish of this car. Uh, it was good enough, is what you could probably call it. Uh, you know, and uh, only on well-preserved examples like this does it look this nice. If you owned one of these things in high school or college and beat the shit out of it, it would look uh, accordingly bad today if it existed at all. Uh, but anyway, you have the three-point seat belts with roof retractors, little place to hang your dry cleaning, which uh, personal luxury coupes would need, and... Uh, everything lovely there in the back. Uh, now, uh, again, being sporty division, I do love that angled. Uh, it's got the whole wraparound cockpit look that actually BMW gets the most credit for, but here it is on a Pontiac and had been on Pontiacs through the second generation iteration of this Grand Prix. Uh, look at the angled up center console. I think that's very, very cool. Uh, this one does have power seats, which with no power windows. That's a weird order, man. Uh, really weird order. You could also get rally gauges, a variety of different options but anyway let's hop in fire it up I hear this big Pontiac fired in life I love Pontiac 400s I think it's the greatest V8 from uh, from this era and to some extent before uh, I turn that down for a minute uh, this also does have a tilt wheel which is nice and it mounts down the column the way that I like it not like the Fords at the end of the wheel uh, it was a very big deal at the time that uh, the headlight dimmers were on the turn signal switch. Uh, in this case, as well as the cruise control uh, activation. So you have a three-way switch. Uh, well, actually, many more ways than that. Like a porn movie. But uh, you've got uh, your cruise function. You've got your turn signal indicators and your high beam dimming all on one uh, switch there on the side. So none of that stuff down with the feet. Uh, you could have had a tack here, didn't have that option, but you do have a nice set of full gauges otherwise. You've got your uh, fuel, your volts, your oil pressure, and your water temp. Uh, there you see 100 mile an hour speedo with um, uh, just 53,000 on the clock, which is actual on this car. Uh, here's your wiper controls over here on the dash. Here's your headlights, nice stuff. Uh, you've got uh, your lighter here with a, you know, a hieroglyphic of what looks like a Zippo on it. Wonderful, nice. I don't know why they had such big, long lighters in the 70s, but they did. Uh, also, your uh, air condition works well in this car. 
uh, very nice and the same one that was in my 79 Firebird which uh, is fun to see uh, as was this badge the radial tune suspension badge the very same uh, here's your defrost uh, this one has the upgraded AM FM uh, stereo 8 track and I am in agony that I didn't bring any of my 8 tracks with me I didn't even think about it so we're stuck with what's ever on the radio Rod Stewart. I can do without Rod Stewart most of the time. 99.9% .9 of the time I'm happy to do without Rod Stewart. He has his moments, but not many of them. Uh, then you've got this nice little pocket here for, you know, that'd be a good place to put a gun, except it would fly out the minute you hit the gas. So I'm not really sure what you could put in there that isn't going to fly out the minute you hit the gas. Probably nothing. Uh, I'm sure it covered some uh, option. I don't know if it had a second stereo option or trip computer, something you might have had down there. Uh, but otherwise, it's just a hole which uh, is so horizontal that nothing's going to stay in there. Weird big courtesy light here on the side of the console. Uh, here you can see it's the Model SJ, again, hearkening to that Duesenberg. Uh, you got a neat little, these all feel very well made for GM. You know, this is not the way it is uh, as, as time progressed. That's a great little snappy ashtray cover. Uh, and of course people did smoke in the 70s so you had to have a good ashtray uh, you've got uh, the same Pontiac shifter you'd find in Trans Ams and uh, Firebirds uh, very nice stuff and uh, again a very well made uh, little center console here and that is a good place to put some guns you could have all kinds of stuff in there uh, even big 70s revolvers I don't know if you got a 44 in there but a 357 no sweat uh, you know especially if it has a 5 or 6 inch barrel or a short barrel 44s with that big 8 inch barrel whatever never never you'd have to have a stubby uh, but nice uh, anyway uh, fit and finish and quality on that I can't believe I'm saying that about a 70s GM product but there it is. Uh, the uh, glove box, nice stuff, all the books that came with this. Uh, I'm going to pull this out for a minute just to see if there's any chance it came with a window sticker. There's a protective plate, there's the manual. Uh, I'm not going to go digging through his books, I don't immediately see a window sticker in here. so. Uh, we'll just leave it uh, as it is, but uh, nice to see this car comes with all these original documents. And uh, actually there is a build sheet there in that back uh, plaque, so let's have a look at that real quick. No trunk release, but I do see it had a plug for one, so probably the luxury models came with that. But anyway, there's the build sheet. I'm going to zero in on that. I may read it when I'm... Uh, at my computer later because I can't see it now with the glasses, but there's the Lando top. I can sort of see it. The steel belted radios, the air conditioning, uh, you know, all the stuff that this would have come with. Uh, I do not see where it's got the invoice total and that sort of thing. I don't know why that's all wiped out, but yeah, anyway, there it is. Close that big heavy door. Put the window down a little bit. Uh, here you see you've got a remote mirror over here. We do have a mirror on the uh, passenger side, but I do not see where it has a remote. Uh, here's a brake release. Um, I, uh, so you probably just have to set that. Uh, I don't like the dash mount. Like on that Mark V, it does have a remote mirror, but you have to lean forward to set it, which immediately takes you out of the position you need to be in to actually see where you're setting it. So it's like a three or four step process where you set it by guess, lean back, find out you're wrong, lean forward, set it again, find out you're better but still wrong, lean forward, set it again. It just seems dumb as hell. I don't know why it worked that way back then, but you know, the engineering wasn't, um, it wasn't always the, the most brilliant thing in terms of absolute function. It seemed to be much more about uh, style, which I guess if I have to balance the world today with the world then, style versus substance, I think I'd go for style. I miss the way these cars look and how different they were from what we have running around today. Everything's so aero and egg-shaped. Uh, let's see, this isn't Dalton's window, so it's probably pretty good. Eh, it's not. probably hasn't been cleaned in a while. He keeps these things in a hanger, so I'll pick it up again at the end of the street. 
All right, so away we go. So the Grand Prix, you know, this one was, even though it was all new in 73 and kind of designed with the gas crunch and emissions in mind, it was still bigger than the prior generation, uh, longer and heavier. Uh, it had a 112 inch wheelbase, uh, but you know, again, part of that and the full frame design is what makes them ride so nice. And I have to say that the Grand Prix really, to me, it's one of the finest entries in the personal uh, luxury coupe uh, genre. It really nicely balances sport and luxury uh, in a way that uh, others didn't, uh, not quite as well. Uh, the ride of the car, the steering, the crispness, the feel of everything, uh, you know, this car today feels really nice driving it around and I know it's a low mileage example but 53,000 miles on 77 was not you know it was not a super low mile car at the time if we go back you know to then uh, and it still feels like new the the way the brakes are the way the steering is um, it really does have a terrific terrific feel all around and that's part of why they sold so well was how nice the cars drove uh, also the Pontiac engines and even the Oldsmobile and uh, the Chevy engine were, you know, very well sorted by the time it came out. So they were reliable. They may not have had the highest horsepower ratings, but uh, and they certainly weren't fantastic on gas, even if they were better at the time. Uh, but they were reliable as hell. The turbo hydro transmission was bulletproof. The uh, the rear axle was, you know, solid and indestructible. Uh, everything was well sorted on this car, so it became very cherished on the used car market. And these cars got a lot of kids in the 80s through high school and college and first jobs and uh, you know they could be bought cheap they started every day they were just like old faithful really terrific cars and that's why a lot of people look back with fond memories of them and uh, even though I didn't have a Grand Prix at the time or really get subjected to anyone who did uh, I can see the charm I can see the charm I love the big long hood with the hood ornament guiding the way uh, I like the feel of the bucket seats pretty easy to find a nice comfortable position and what a terrific Boulevard cruiser uh, which is probably why these things are really starting to tick up on the uh, collector market they were forgotten for a while uh, but not anymore you know now real nice examples are fetching uh, you know twice of what they used to in just a few short years and yeah I get it you know time marches on and people realize what they've been missing collectors realize just how good and they made a shitload of I mean get 280,077 so what a great collector car you're not gonna have too much of a trouble finding parts and trim and pieces you know there were so many out there and I'm sure there's a lot of them rotting away in Arizona junkyard so uh, fenders and doors and all, all that stuff really just shouldn't be a problem and of course the corporate V8s they're easy to get parts for so uh, what a great fun way to have a collector car. I wish this one was for sale. It's not. He loves it. You know, I will say this. Everything's for sale. Everything's always for sale. Uncle Tommy sells stuff that he says he's not going to, so maybe he'll sell this one. I don't know, but uh, don't don't call Auto House of Naples and ask about it. It's not one of their cars, and uh, they won't know what the hell you're asking about. Uh, this is just one that I borrowed again from a private collection, so... Uh, you know, I'll make another little short video on it if it ever does come for sale and you're interested in it. So, anyway, there it is 1977 Pontiac Grand Prix, third generation Grand Prix out of uh, seven total, and uh, it, certainly the most prolific, the one that sold the most of all. So, you could call it the most successful Grand Prix of all time, especially the 77, the most prolific year. And uh, a lovely car to drive, a nice car to look at, and uh, a very nice car to drive. So thanks very much for having a look. Appreciate it. I'm taking it back to Owl's Place, so no highway trip today. Uh, but uh, I've got a really nice Mark III coming up. That's an auto house car. Uh, probably have that on Thursday. And uh, then we'll see what else we can put together. So thanks for having a look. Appreciate it. And we'll see you with the next one.